Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Association for Baha'i Studies Conference 2020 in our um, unusual new format, not live with all of you present, but live virtually. Uh, welcome to this session. It's entitled, Knowledge is a Veritable Treasure, the Present and Future of Baha'i Contributions to Libraries, Archives, and Museums. I'm Bill Collins. I'm the moderator for this evening. And uh, I want to give you some background on what we're doing and who all of the, the participants are in this uh, panel. This is a panel discussion about Baha'i approaches to libraries, archives, and museums. Panelists include an academic librarian, an archivist, and a museum professional. We will identify relevant discourses to which Baha'is can contribute, explore ways in which institutions of cultural memory can contribute to the community building process, and present libraries, archives, and museums as important professional pathways for Baha'i students. So the first person I'm going to introduce is Lev Rickards is the Associate University Librarian for Collections and Scholarly Communication at Santa Clara University. He holds a Master of Science in Information from the University of Michigan and a Bachelor of Arts in Biology from Carleton College. Lorraine Sheldon serves as Outreach Librarian at the Gibson D. Lewis Health Science Library in Fort Worth, Texas, connecting communities in the North Texas area with knowledge and resources available through the National Library of Medicine. She previously served at the Baha'i World Center as a photo archivist and received her MS in Information Science from the University of North Texas. Third, we had Ev Ed Sevcik, who serves as the archivist at the US Baha'i National Center. He previously served at the Baha'i World Center and received his Master of Information Studies from the University of Texas. We also have uh, May Lample, who is a race discourse officer at the US Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. May coordinates the office's collaboration with individuals, organizations, and agencies in the US engaged in public discourses and policy advocacy directed toward racial, racial justice and racial unity. Prior to joining the office in 2017, May worked in health education and community mobilization for Southeastern health in maternal health research for Kimanya Ngeyo in Uganda and in global discourse on the equality of women and men for the Institute for Studies in Global Prosperity in Israel. May has an MPH in maternal and child health from University of California, Berkeley and a BA in political science from Haverford. College. And PJ Andrews coordinates the Office of Public Affairs of the Baha'is of the U.S. collaboration with individuals, organizations, and agencies in the U.S. engaged in public discourses and policy advocacy directed toward racial justice and racial unity. I will turn it over to uh, Lev and the rest of the panel for their presentation. Thank you, Bill. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, we're going to jump in uh, with a question that's primarily for Ed and Lorraine um, about the, their course of study and what practical preparation they needed for their jobs. But I'd also like to bring uh, PJ and May into that conversation, if they could share a bit about what brings them to this panel, because it's perhaps not obvious how, how public discourse connects to libraries and archives and museums. So we'll start with, uh, with Ed. Hello. Uh, well, practical, my, my practical course of study and what led me to this position. Uh, my undergraduate university degree was in history, which is very common for people who end up as archivists, that they took an undergraduate in history. And after receiving that, I didn't go, many people that do a history undergrad go into, right into a history PhD, or they go into uh, a profession like teaching. And I didn't do either one of those for various reasons. I worked a number of different jobs. I, was, I worked as a, a 
office manager for a startup. I worked end up uh, worked end up a software compliance for a bank and some other things like this. Uh, and that I mentioned that because it, it it turned out to be more important than I thought at the time. But at a later time, I went back to uh, my alma mater, the University of Texas, and uh, did a two year information studies master. Uh, which to work in the profession is the terminal degree. You typically don't need a PhD unless you're going on to university teaching or something like that. And, uh, and quickly, the information studies embraces library, uh, archives, and other areas. And I quickly found that I was just drawn to the archival end of the work, the ar archival enterprise. And was very lucky to have a... Um, an internship, essentially a job at one of the prestigious uh, historical collecting archives at the University of Texas, the Center for American History, which is now the Briscoe Center for American History. And what I discovered there was first that the the work in the work in that in that institution taught me at least as much as I was learning in my courses, and also the fact that I had spent some years working in a variety of different areas actually turned out to be a tremendous advantage because having some experience actually made me a better archivist. It made me able, more able to, to look at the documents generated by people who had done lots of different things and kind of see the sense and the logic of how those put together. Following that, I did uh, offer service to the Baha'i World Center in Haifa and uh, was honored to be accepted to serve there uh, for about 10 years as an archivist in their department. And it was a very, uh, it was a very enriching experience in many ways. And upon returning to the US, I was able, I was uh, found a position here at the National Center as an archivist. So uh, that's how I'm, that's how I ended up where I am. Wonderful, thank you, Ed. And how about you, Lorraine? Uh, yes, I think, uh... As Ed referenced, it's actually a, a strength to come from a, a very a variety of fields. So really, you can start anywhere um, because ultimately, information comes in many different forms. I think the most common people think of as books, but really, it could be media, photography, objects. Um, so for for me, I actually have a bachelor's in radio, television, film production. So I did that for many years and I had a minor in photography. And how I kind of uh, ended up in this field is actually I, I started as a photo cataloger uh, for my university photographer. And then um, from there went to the World Center for several years. And um, upon returning, because I wasn't familiar with the field there in applying for jobs, they're like, oh, you need a master's. You're like, oh, okay, all right, I'll do this. Uh, so. As I was studying, uh, getting my uh, master's in, in information science, uh, I also served as a regional coordinator. So that um, in-depth, that constant, uh, you know, work and community building uh, through the, the learning process that the Baha'is are doing, um, that really led me to the position I have now, which is really a combination of community development and information science, uh, because I, I work in community engagement with a focus on uh, health literacy, health information, because I'm at an academic university that trains uh, medical professionals, uh, doctors, uh, DOs, things like that. So, so it was really, you know, like Ed mentioned, this combination of, of life experience in a variety of fields, a variety of experiences that um, brought me to the profession. Wonderful, thank you. And May and PJ, could you maybe connect it for us? What brings you to this panel? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone, glad to be here. So May and my work uh, focuses at the level of discourse. And so we really work at the level of thought, trying to contribute Baha'i ideas and concepts and principles to um, the evolution of thought, particularly as it relates to the national discourse on race in America for the Office of Public Affairs. And early on in our, our time working, when we came on in about uh, November 2017, um, we were thinking a lot about the question of, of narrative um, and, and conceptions of history. Actually, the, the early part of the uh, March 2nd, 2013 message to the Baha'is in Iran um, in sort of laying out the, the, the Baha'i vision of global transformation 
emphasizes conceptions of history very early on and what is the Baha'i conception of history. And so we were, we were thinking that um, actually in the discourse on race, a lot of um, a big strand is the stories we tell each other, which stories we tell ourselves about race um, and how that can have a really powerful role about understanding who we are um, and can also and traditionally has um, been told sort of in a, a framework of, of contest and conflict um, that furthers conceptions of us and them. And so we were really interested in, in what um, role history could play in helping us envision uh, a future of America that is that is free from racism, but also reflects um, oneness, our, our inherent oneness, but also um, our, our diversity, the unity of our, and how we express unity and diversity. Um, and so we started to engage um, historians, museum archivists, librarians, um, who were telling stories and narratives, uh, weaving narratives about race um, in, hist in, in sort of historical narratives about race. And um, we've actually been able to convene that group a few times and um, have developed sort of a, a concept note that guides the way that we think about um, our engagement with that group of professionals. Um, and so uh, we, and one of the people we actually worked with at one point was Lev. Um, and so that's how we ended up on, on this panel. And we probably will share um, our experiences and insights that have been generated by working with that, that group of people from, from different professions. I'm glad, I'm glad you're all here and that you can be a part of this conversation. So thank you. Um, this next question is really for everyone, but I think we can start with May. Is there a particular concept from the revelation of Baha'u'llah that has changed the way you think about libraries and archives? Thank you. Um, like PJ mentioned, one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is around this idea of telling history, specifically the idea of telling history as a form of justice. So the idea from, from the writings, this idea that truth is one has been really helpful for us in the way we tell history or the, the conversations that we try to have around the telling of history. Um, Abdul Baha said that if five people meet together to seek for truth, they must begin by cutting themselves free from all their own spe special conditions and renouncing all preconceived ideas. In order to find truth, we must give up our prejudices our own small trivial notions. An open receptive mind is essential. So history is really a field of human knowledge that attempts to highlight truth. But like PJ mentioned, it's really been used as a way of promoting particular ideologies that often can really um, cause or reinforce a variety of permutations of us and them. So we have to tell history in a way that does that we can tell history in that way. That's one way, but, but we're really trying to think about how can we tell history um, in a way that reflects that we are one people, like PJ mentioned. So I, in keeping all that in mind, I think that the role of libraries and archives really um, becomes how do we investigate truth? They have an opportunity to offer you know, frameworks or tools that help us investigate tr truth they can offer a variety of narratives that help us underscore truth from different perspectives that provide a richness to, to, a, to a story, to a particular chapter in history. But it's really important that they also promote this idea that truth is one. And Lorraine. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, me. One of the the concepts for from the revelation that particularly uh, speaks to the work I do is this idea of being able to seek truth and that like one of the greatest oppressions that can can take place is someone seeking having the desire to seek truth wishing to uh, to come to that and, and not being able to find it so again I think um, you know these kinds of institutions and communities kind of facilitate that they really um, create that universal access, access to, to communities to engage knowledge. And, and then I think as well, which I'll get maybe answer later questions is this um, 
thirst for knowledge, this uh, desire to engage in the generation of knowledge that uh, you know every human being has inherently. So, thank you. And Ed, how about you? Uh, a particular concept from the revelation that has changed the way you think about archives? Well, following on what May said, with archives, speaking particularly from archive perspective, the, the sort of dirty little secret of archives in general is that for thousands of years, it's been true that it was relatively expensive and time consuming to keep and maintain records in good order. And therefore the only people who did it were kings and princes and folks who for one reason or another wanted to use the archives as an instrument to control other people. Wanted to make sure they paid their taxes and served in the army when they were supposed to and all the rest of that stuff. So archives have this long legacy of basically being an instrument of state power that assists the state in essentially dominating the people who live under the jurisdiction of the state. The concept from the revelation of Baha'u'llah that I have been meditating on is the concept of service and the concept that it, it could have, the way Abdu'l-Baha talks about it, Abdu'l-Baha talks a bit about power and service. He talks, he says, the power is still there in any feature that had power under the old world, but it's been transformed by the concept that power is authentic when it's used in, in service to humanity, not in the interests of some narrow group. So the I think this is a concept uh, that has obviously related ideas have been in the discourse of archives and libraries as professional institutions for some time. But when I engage with those ideas, I come at them from this concept of that the power is real and the obligation to service is also real. And that makes it important who we, who we understand ourselves to be serving and how we're doing that. Thank you. This next question is for Lorraine. What role can libraries, archives, and museums play in the community building process of the five-year plan? So this is obviously a big question because um, the community building process is a, a broad framework, um, but maybe I'll approach this in terms of the generation of knowledge and the role of every human being as a protagonist in that generation of knowledge. Um, so, you know, really that is at the heart of it, this, this right and obligation that every human being has to contribute to the advancement of society. Um, so it's, you know, through this environment that is created that that makes it possible. So really, you know, in this way, these institutions, libraries, archives, um, and museums are, are really the only established institutions and communities where people of all backgrounds, age, um, religious, all, all sorts can come together and intersect. Uh, you know, even in education, you know, it's set for a particular person, they have a, a particular goal, but these are open and neutral spaces where, where people, the purpose is to engage with information, with, with knowledge that's generated. Um, so, you know, I think knowledge, information, you know, comes in a variety of forms. And this is, you know, really important for people to engage these, these different um, kind of resources. And uh, just to, to think through my thought, uh, you know, it, it requires to, to make new knowledge, it requires the engagement of previously existing knowledge. So there is that, that role that these institutions play and also when information, when insights are gained, uh, even at a local level, you know, these institutions can take on the role of being repositories for those insights um, from communities. So really it's this, this kind of interplay of, of being both a physical space, a neutral space, a place where, where people from, from every background are coming for the specific purpose of engaging information. Um, and then the, to take it to the next step is, is really to, to help them be protagonists rather than just um, patrons that are served. And then specifically, and I imagine um, the rest of the panelists can speak more specifically to this, but this engagement with history that archives 
and museums can play, which is, has been mentioned. Um, knowing where you are in the context of history is also something that these institutions can provide to the community building process. Because in order to, to move forward, you have to know where you've been. You have to um, make your decisions and reflect in this kind of constant action reflection and consultation with uh, reliable resources, with uh, an actual read of reality. And um, that requires both you know, information and also uh, uh, an understanding of history. Thank you. Uh, PJ, and perhaps also for Lorraine, what role can libraries, archives, and museums play in social action and in efforts to transform society? Yeah, um, so just to, just to return to this, uh, some of the work that we've been doing, and um, actually another uh, principle from the revelation that has been on our, our are as an area of inquiry for us is the relationship between justice and unity. Um, and so we've been guided by a statement of Baha'u'llah where he says that the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. And so there's this sort of like, you know, obviously intimate connection between these two, these two massive principles. And, you know, when we were trying to explore what that could look like in the context of the national discourse and race and how the connection between these two principles might actually um, be contribute, you know, how we might contribute this idea from the faith. Um, it seemed like we needed to get more concrete because they're such huge ideas. And so then we were thinking that um, there's this, there's, there's a, a big field that's starting to gain a little traction in the United States. And, and of course has a long history in the United States, although maybe a little bit quieter, but it's, that of truth and reconciliation. Um, and we felt that in many ways, um, those are expressions of justice and unity. So, so truth is an expression of justice. Um, and then uh, reconciliation is a, an expression of, of, of oneness. And we thought actually that history, that there's sort of this bridge of repair between uh, truth and reconciliation, there needs to be a, something you can walk over to get from one place to the other. And that history actually plays an incredible role in that. And in fact, it was a conversation with Lev where he, he told us that the word remember um, is, is intimately connected to reconciliation. It's to bring, um, to bring the parts of the, the body together, to remember the body. And so I think in many ways that's incredibly relevant to the, to the history of, of the United States that we've and had incredible damage done to the, the, the oneness of our, our American politic of our body. Um, and so we have to somehow remember that and, and history can help us in that, in that regard. Um, so, so I just wanted to bring up, so that's the sort of the context that led us to work with historians, archivists, museum curators and, and librarians um, was, was learning how we can find these narratives that will help us become whole again. And so then um, two areas that we are focusing on, and I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible. One is um, history as a catalyst for reconciliation. Um, so this idea of repair was one. We're really trying to explore, explore that in practice um, and, and see if we can find examples of, of this in, in reality. Um, and you know, one, one example that does come to mind is the, the Peace and Justice Memorial in Montgomery. Um, Put together by the um, the Equal Justice Initiative, and and really what they've done is they've created um, a story of of how the how they can say how how slavery hasn't ended; it's evolved, and they tell an amazing story, and then they take you to a, a monument place, a place where you can really reflect on the impact of the legacy of the, the lynching of, of African Americans between a certain period of American history. But then they also um, try and create a, di a dialogue around that history. They don't just end with, with um, remember. They, they actually try and create, at, their, at that center, they have a, a, a conversation discussion space that, that is open to the public for a conversation. But then they also have taken that, this model and, and connected it nationally. So if you are able to find, um, a, a lynching that happened in your community, if you can do the work of, of bringing together the people, people in that community to understand that history, 
they will sort of send you a monument and, and have an installation in it. And it basically furthers a conversation um, towards reconciliation, which is very profound. And then the, the other area is the idea of um, history as a, as a, a means for transformation. Um, and one of the people that we work with is at the Georgetown Slavery Archive, and he's also a history professor there. He's white and Jewish, um, and he's, a, he's basically dedicated his life to the history of, of teaching the history of slavery and also um, developing the slavery archive at, a, at an institution. Um, and he was telling us that um, his, his journey is that he was able to, through his st study of, of slavery over time, and as he got closer and closer to the primary resources, to those artifacts of slavery, as he sort of was able to become exposed to the brutalization of that history, um, he became transformed. He became a champion of, of uh, racial justice and really wanted to tell a different story of American history that many people don't know. Um, and so he's sort of dedicated his life to that. So it made us think that yeah, actually history can be a really powerful tool for transformation. And so we're trying to see, especially for people who maybe parts of history they don't feel or see themselves a part of, um, but, or, or communities that they don't see themselves a part of, but as they learn that this is part of our collective history or collective um, heritage, then they, they, they transform their outlook and, and become something different. So I, I guess taking the perspective of libraries, um, and I'll, I'll caveat this with this being particularly my opinion, um, but I think, you know, libraries, the area of libraries has some growth that needs to be done. Because in some cases, uh, the approach is still very much a transactional one, a very passive uh, I'm providing you this thing, this object or a service. And it's not really, uh, hasn't always become about engagement or building something. Um, but regardless, uh, I'll, I'll maybe speak from the perspective of my current work. So uh, my, my position, I'm at a medical library, but my position is ex exclusively uh, outwardly oriented. So my perspective is really to focus on the, the generality of the community um, outside of faculty, staff, and students, and really help build uh, health literacy. So giving people, building capacity within people of the community to locate, evaluate, and apply um, the knowledge that they, they engage with, really to build um, the health of the community and help individuals, you know, apply this capacity and share it with their, their family and their friends. So in a way, um, something that, you know, might, could be just transactional um, of here's information and very passive, we're taking that and, and creating a more active role, giving someone uh, a power to, to do it themselves, to share it with other people and really um, build healthier communities with others. So, so I think that's a strength. And for particularly with working with public libraries um, in my work, they have natural um, community neighborhoods. They have regular patrons. Um, so as we build this uh, kind of consciousness that the library can serve your, your health information needs, they can really be a service in that way. Um, it becomes a, a place where people can have a conversation about that. Um, and, you know, we've even done uh, particular projects where we, we talk about uh, DNA health and genetic health and, and people walk away uh, not just knowing information, but recognizing that now they have a responsibility to contribute to the discourse around this because it, it is such an emerging field of pre precision medicine and things like that. So, so in that way, um, libraries have this role as informal educators and um, they're, they're starting to really grow in this way and move beyond the traditional concepts that people might have about them. Thank you both. So now for everyone, and maybe we can loop back around to Ed to start us off, what are some of the relevant discourses in librarianship and archival science to which you have or would like to contribute? 
Well, there's a this is kind of an embarrassment of riches an archiving uh, archival science specifically. It's a it's a very diverse profession. Uh, there's it's as diverse as archives are. Two discourses that I've been thinking about and that I think you know that have come to mind in response to this question is first the the, the discourse around archival ethics around the management of information that may be of a very personal or very um, or, or very specific nature. Archives by their very nature don't always contain the full record of the truth of the lives of the people that are represented in them. Uh, very often, the only record that remains of a person may be when they happen to come in contact with the government somehow because they either did something wrong or were accused of doing something wrong or were abused. And so, the the one of the areas around ethics that archivists are, uh, that's that's a that's a discourse in archival enterprise generally is around is around representation of people and and the management of that. In my particular case with the with the National Baha'i Archives, of course, we hold many collections of personal and intimate papers and records that people have trusted the National Spiritual Assembly with. Uh, and now those people, most of them are deceased and uh, the deceased are in a position of weakness. They are not able to stand up and defend their, you know, their honor. And yet in the constitution of the Universal House of Justice, one of the, one of the duties that the House of Justice lays upon itself and which devolves in some degree to its subsidiary organizations is to protect human honor. And so the, this, this raises some interesting questions about access, legitimate access by scholars and historians to records, but also the implications of making certain kinds of information available in certain ways. So that's one. And I'll shoehorn in another one, uh, which is the idea, one that interests me a, a, a lot is the idea of what we call sort of community archiving, uh, grassroots archiving, in which the archive rather kind of transitions gradually from being this place where an institution stores its official records and people go there to find stuff and becomes a center in which the community can actually have a participatory role in generating and then placing records of its activities and its hopes and dreams and whatever in there. And the, and the institution kind of helps to structure that and helps the community tell its own story. Uh, new technologies facilitate that, but it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging area that, that there's a lot of talk about. How about May? Yeah, I'll actually, touch on what Ed was just mentioning at, towards the end of his comments, that one of the, the areas of the discourse that we're really thinking about is around expanding participation in the generation of knowledge around history. Because um, we really need institutions that can promote a learning process around various areas of knowledge that, and, and that recognize that we need instruments for a growing number of people to participate in that generation and application of knowledge. Um, I wanted to give two examples actually from, organ, uh, from institutions that we have been collaborating with. So one um, is this archives at Georgetown University that PJ had mentioned before. Um, they have a slavery archives because the university, the founding of the university or the growth of the university um, was really based on the selling of 272 enslaved people. And as part of the university's attempt to reconcile or reckon with its history, it's, it has started this um, archives. And originally the, the, ma the majority of the archives was made up really um, by records that were the records of people who owned enslaved people. So they were things like bills of sale, they were records of ships, there were baptism logs because Georgetown is a Jesuit university or founded by Jesuits that is. Um, and because of their work around um, trying to reckon with their history, they've been really reaching out more with the descendants of these 272 enslaved people. Um, and they've started to bring in their stories much more into the archives. So they have um, bills of sale, they have like, I'm sorry, 
certificates of freedom, they have interviews with the descendants, they have more profiles of people who have been enslaved. Um, so it, we're really seeing a shift in, in who's able to participate and whose stories are told in this archives, um, which is really exciting. And then another sort of smaller example is um, in DC, there's a museum, the Anacon Anacostia Community Museum, which is actually a Smithsonian museum, but it's also a community-based museum. So it has federal funding, but it's really located within a particular neighborhood in Washington, DC. And one of their recent exhibits was called A Right to the City. Um, and it focused on six neighborhoods in, in Washington, DC and looked at five decades of evolution in those neighborhoods and individuals that contributed to shaping them and, organi and or community organizing and civic engagement that was happening around housing, transit and education. Um, and at the end of the exhibit, actually, there was a telephone booth that was uh, allowed people who were visiting, many of whom are community members who experienced this history, to actually record their own stories so that it, it allowed them to be a part of the exhibit. Um, so those are just sort of small ex examples, but really thinking about how we can draw more and more people into the telling of, their, of this history. And PJ and then Lorraine. Um, I don't have too much to add. I just, I, you know, I'll just underscore what Lorraine said at the beginning about the, the power of expanding conception of who is able to participate in the generation and diffusion of knowledge in this area. And, and just, um, just, I was thinking about this statement from the, uh, I think it was the May, 2018 message from the International Teaching Center where they talk about how uh, cluster agencies are developing capacity to tell the story of their cluster as it unfolds. So I think um, we, we can just see the future, like his, the, the ability to, to contribute to the development of narratives, like starting to emerge even at the very, very local grassroots. Um, and then, you know, you can even imagine that that capacity of, of documenting and writing the unfolding story of a cluster, you know, starting to be embedded in like junior youth groups and study circles, telling the story of the community that's emerging around those activities. So um, I think there's, there's, I forget what question six was, what this last question was, but I, well, yeah, just this relevant discourse is, is that of, of generation of knowledge and, and how it's reflected also in in the community building efforts, just to underscore what something Lorraine brought up at the beginning. Um, so I, I think as I mentioned before on the day-to-day, the -day, I'm obviously thinking about the discourse around, you know, shifting librarianship, not just to being uh, transactional, but to really thinking about being a, as a, a facilitator, libraries are facilitators of these conversations and communities and really working on building capacity. But I think also a really relevant area or uh, discourse um, that we're hoping to contribute to is, is that of um, scholarly communication. Um, this is a conversation uh, particularly that happens a lot in academic libraries, like university libraries. Um, you know, there's a lot of polarization that, you know, information has this desire to be free, it should all be free. And then that is in contrary to how the particular model is currently that a lot of information is behind paywalls. Um, and I think, you know, particularly from the health perspective, when you think about uh, physicians needing the most recent um, information about particular diseases, how that that feels unjust in a way that, uh, you know, we want professionals to have the most uh, up to date information and, and how we can, you know, make that possible, like striking a balance. So it, there's definitely um, transactional models, there's models right now for how information is um, sold or, or available to the general public, how it's accessible to to only academics. There's a, a lot, it's a large expansive conversation, um, scholarly communication, open access um, that requires a lot of uh, thought and it intersects a lot with um, just 
information, uh, intellectual property as well. So it's, it's fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing these thoughts. Um, I think with the help of our chairperson, we're going to open it up for questions now. So for uh, those in the audience, if you haven't yet figured out how to do this, I mentioned to mention, uh, meant to mention it earlier, uh, scroll down in your browser and look for the add comment button and click on that and you can send in questions. Um, I just wanted to sort of add to something that I see that the panelists are talking about is libraries and archives and museums aren't merely about preserving yesterday's history. They're also about using that history to generate new knowledge and new experience. And this is, I think, at the heart of what is being discussed here. Um, so there are, there are a few questions up now. And the first two are kind of related. So if you don't mind, panel, I'm going to give you both questions at the same time. Uh, it's a perennial question that librarians and archivists and museum people get. With propagation of digital technology, technology, what is the role of libraries in the future? Then the second is, I worry that the transition to online only sources of information that have traditionally been preserved on paper will hamper the research of Baha'i researchers in the future. Any thoughts? And I think these are two related questions. So please, I look to the panel here and uh, it, it certainly seems that our audience is very wise. They, they knew to pose both of these questions at the same time. I'm sure others on the panel will have a lot more to say about this, um, but I, I'll just mention that libraries are certainly already deeply engaged in digital collections, libraries and archives, uh, and to an extent museums, although it's a bit different. Um, certainly in the university context, um, an academic library is providing a great deal of online resources. Many of the traditional academic journals and even scholarly monographs are now provided as eBooks and as, as PDFs through a variety of platforms. And actually a lot of the, the um, budget of a university library uh, is used to, to pay the subscription fees and the paywalls that Lorraine was mentioning. Um, and then when you turn to the university archives, um, there's a great deal of effort to digitize uh, manuscripts and digitize other material and make them available um, and increasingly findable uh, on, on the web. But I'm sure others will have more to say. Um, I think you addressed maybe the academic. Uh, since I work with public libraries, I might mention that um, libraries, you know, again, this idea of information, it, it goes beyond uh, just a book, right? So the internet is obviously a huge uh, part of access to information. So when you think about, for instance, the, the recent pandemic, um, libraries have this ability to check out, for instance, hotspots to provide that access to information. There's a lot of communities that are on the other side of the digital divide. They don't have um, the access that everyone has necessarily to um, things we might take for granted, just having a computer, having access to, to information. And I think also um, for particularly public libraries and also academic libraries, there's a community around this physical space. And um, while digital you know, connects the world, uh, there is still a place for, for local. And um, so besides just uh, providing access to digital uh, technologies and information, there, there'll always be a space locally uh, to engage and be together. And I think, especially at this time period in our lives, there, there's just a, a thirst for social interaction and I don't think that'll ever go away. I'll, so uh, Lev and Lorraine have talked eloquently about the this wonderful contemporary roles of libraries and archives as spaces of collaboration and access and bringing people in and, and creation of knowledge. And I'm gonna now, I'm gonna now go against all of that and talk about the old traditional antique role of libraries and archives in this area, which is preserving stuff and just keeping it and making sure that it persists into the longer term. And the first truth that I believe, I don't know if I could cite 
a, a source on this, but I've certainly picked it up from a wide range of experience in this profession, is that the primary, re the, 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 all the problems with digital technology, well, most of them are actually new versions of old problems. And the central old problem is that records don't disappear because their formats become obsolete and unreadable. They disappear because people throw them away. Most records have always, and books and everything else has always, the ones that have been destroyed, the vast majority of them, it's because of institutional failure. Whoever was keeping them just stopped functioning and the thing was thrown away. Um, or the institution didn't fail, but they decided they no longer needed that and they tossed it in the trash or allowed it to just slip away and be lost. And so with digital records, the same problem occurs, but digital records have all sorts of different areas of fragility that uh, we're not really used to with physical records. Uh, one of the most important is that digital information can be distorted in ways that it's hard to perceive. You can call up a digital document that you've had in your digital storage. And in fact, what comes up is only part of it. Maybe it lost its footnotes or something like that, but you don't know because you don't know what it was supposed to look like. And so the, one of the rules, so the answer in my approach to question number one on the role of libraries, obviously they have many roles, which Lev and Lorraine have just spoken to, but one role is as an institution performing the function of ascertaining the authenticity of the material that, it, that they're providing to the public. And that's another role that archives have as well. It's not just that we provide something, it's that we, we're supposed to, I mean, I, obviously this is a struggle and a challenge, but our institutional capacity is partly supposed to be to ensure that what we, we can say what we are providing and that it's what we, if we said we provided the same thing 10 years ago, that it actually was the same thing. Now, uh, just briefly on question two, the, it's interesting that the questioner mentioned the transition to online only sources, because that's, dis, that's actually distinct. Online only is a distinct type of digital information. It's not just digital versus paper, it's online, which means it's maintained by somebody else that gives you access to it and could take that access away at any time. If they fail as an institution, or if they just decide they no longer want to give you the access, or they get careless or a building burns down or whatever. The, so not only do we have the problem with things being digital as such, and there's issues with just preserving and maintaining digital records on their own, there's also this that you're in a relationship with a provider of the records. And so that relationship becomes a very important thing to think about and to maintain, which is why libraries spend quite a bit of resources to have relationships with the purveyors of these various information resources. You know, the, uh, the, my, my alma mater, the University of Texas, had a relationship with a journal, a big scientific journal of some kind, I forget what it was, and the journal went out of business. And these were in the days when there was no, there was no recourse for that. They just suddenly went dark. The website disappeared. And the University of Texas said, we've been paying, you know, they called them up and found people and said, we've been paying you thousands of dollars a month for this. You're not just going to go away. And so in the end, a truck showed up and they just unloaded cases and cases of hard drives at the loading dock of the Perry Castaneda Library in Austin, Texas, and said, here you go, take care of it. And so the University of Texas became the owner of this back issues of this journal. So these are, uh, the, that preservation role is, a, is really, it is a serious challenge. Uh, there are ways of approaching it and there's a lot of thought and discourse in the field about it. So it's not something I bet we're just totally lost, but it is a serious challenge. And the only hope I can offer just to circle back to what I was saying at the beginning is that it's a, in many ways, it's actually a kind of challenge that we've, that's been around for a long time, but it's just resurfacing in a new way because we're using this technology differently. That would actually be uh, uh, the kind of question that we could do a whole session with the ABS on this whole question of digitization and what it means and so on. Um, it, there's also a question about validating information held or submitted to the library. Is there a place for libraries to be involved in the peer review process? 
or to ensure the integrity of validation processes. I think Ed addressed that to a certain degree in terms of the digital things. Do any of you want to address anything with that? So we have three more questions that are coming after this, and I think we should allow some time, more time for them. Um, and I don't think there's so much experience there, but perhaps a brief uh, comment would just be yeah. that libraries participate in that process in two ways. Librarians as scholars, uh, as those who, who are tenure track or have something akin to a tenure track need to publish. And as such, there are journals in librarianship and in archival science and librarians and archivists are often called on to, to serve as peer reviewers in their own discipline. And then there is a bit of a movement related to, to scholarly right. communication and open access that Lorraine mentioned for libraries to become involved in academic publishing to, to assist in the publication of journals. And by extension, then uh, let, let's say it's a journal about history, maybe, maybe a particular local or regional history. It could be that the library helps to facilitate the peer review process for a journal that they're directly involved in producing. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next question, which is about Abdul Baha's travels to the West and how he contributed to the eradication of racism and the unity of the races. And uh, the question is, can the, the, the important historical phenomena, the, the first interracial behind marriage and the unity feasts and others be something that would be added to the um, the resources at the National Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C. PJ May. Yeah, I can start to answer this question and PJ can jump in. So actually, PJ and I have been developing a relationship with the religious religion center at the National Museum of African American History um, and Culture. The center has a longer name. I can't remember its full name, um, but they they are basically dedicated to really exploring the variety of religious life among African Americans. So they're very interested in incorporating as many religious experiences as possible, um, including through like through um, original materials from diff pe different people of different faiths, um, including also narrative stories of um, African Americans people of import, but it also doesn't have to be people of import, it could just be anyone who is of a, part, of a particular faith and is African American. Um, he also explained that initially, the, 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 when the museum started, they didn't have the center. So actually religion is sort of like, kind of a little bit in places in the museum, but there's not really a focal point. Um, and also in order to get an exhibit in the museum, that's like a, 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 a long process there's like he explained it was something like a 10 year they have it planned out for 10 years so in order to see more new um items actually incorporated into the museum is quite a process um because they really have things planned out but there already are um of course well-known african-american baha'is already exist in the museum people like elaine Locke um and robert abbott the the um, founder of the Chicago Defender, among, just to give two examples, are already there. So I think that this is a process that we're engaged in, but to, to get into a museum with the size of Namak, that really takes time for them to introduce new exhibits. I don't know, if PJ, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, just that they are um, in the process of uh, this center, this, I think it's the Center for the Study of African-American Religious Life and Culture. Um, is part of their work is collecting as much as possible information about um, basic black di religious diversity, the diversity of, of black religious life in America. And so he has, a, the, our contact there has a really cool job. He gets in contact with, because um, the, the main thrust of religion as May was saying is very limited at the museum. So it's usually, it's either, in the context of Christianity and the civil rights movement or just Christianity in general or in the nation of Islam. So there's really not much on display. So, so anything outside of that, he is reaching out to um, and trying to uh, basically go, he goes and interviews them. Like when we had met him last time, he had just finished interviewing um, black nuns in Louisiana and was going to interview black Mormons in Utah. Um, and collect their stories. So whether or not it gets presented at the museum is one is, is like May said as a question, but at least the museum is collecting. 
Um, and so then now we're in consultation with him to, to collect more information about the African-American Baha'i experience. Um, and so we, we hope that, that can at least be in, in the archives. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, we, we work with a really creative historian archivist um, Baha'i named Lex Musta, who some of you may know. Um, and we're working with Lex loosely to kind of develop a, you know, maybe a Baha'i tour of the museum so that if you wanted to, you could um, look at the museum through the lens um, through the lens of the African American, through the lens of the Baha'i experience. Oh, we have three other questions, and I don't know we'll get to all of them within the time we have. But I wanted to ask the question that's related to PJ and May's uh, comments: How to view the processes of information access, preservation, generation, and dissemination as an aid to helping Baha'is develop? a deeper understanding of the narrative surrounding the most challenging issue. I can um, share just, just from the, my experience as a Baha'i in Washington, DC, um, there's a really beautiful, um, there's a, th this, this community is very intentional about understanding its history and the, and the legacy of the DC Baha'i community happens to be one of, of interracial harmony. That's been sort of a focus. So Louis Gregory became a Baha'i here um, Pocahontas Pope, who um, actually our dear Bill here did an amazing uh, amount of research on um, to unearth that story, um, received the first a tablet from Abdul Baha where he said that she was the first um, African American Baha'i of Washington DC. So that the the assembly, the institutions in DC have really done a lot of work to incorporate the, the interracial history of, of the faith in DC. Um, and promote the nobility of, the, of African Americans who have become Baha'is and, and not only the great stuff that's happened, but also the challenges of that history and then use that um, to inspire uh, the work of the DC Baha'i community in the present moment. Um, and, and really, and so I think both in terms of addressing questions of race, class and culture, but also in the way that we think about who we teach and, and, and how the teaching work unfolds in the cluster. Um, is, is informed by that history, which is very intentionally brought forward. We have very few minutes left and there's a couple questions left that relate to each other. Maybe we can get one or two comments. How do we control the spread of misinformation in the age of digital media? And how do we know what is true? How do we filter what is kept? I can take a shot. Very briefly, the process of filtering what is true and deciding what is kept in archives is called appraisal. And it is a notoriously fraught area of the discipline. Archivists go, there's a, there's a discourse around it. There's a lot of thought around it. There's some studies, but basically it's not, it's not always easy to do that. Uh, one thing that typically ends up happening is that whoever is doing it must take into account the interests and priorities of the organization or institution that they're a part of. And so there tends to be a prioritization of things that are related directly to one's own institution, to one's own area of expertise and activities and the, so on. And then things that, that come in from other, from other bodies or individuals that are not related tend to get less, uh, less attention to them. Uh, as far as challenging the spread of misinformation, I, I'm, I'm going to be quiet on this because I don't know too much about it, but I say I think this is an area of scholarship. This is where scholarship, where people, you, you can, archives can have lots of genuinely antique, authentic documents that are full of lies and, uh, and, and outright forged documents can actually be making true statements as well. You can do all, there's all kinds of permutations of this. And it requires the human mind and heart to reflect upon these things and, and, and put them in context. And that's kind of what scholarship is. That's what history is. That's what we're all sort of engaged in is the process of, of bringing truth to light from materials of the world that are not necessarily giving us the full picture. And I'll just add to that just really quickly that I think the, the power of consultation, I think the quote that May referenced at the very beginning is a way to uh, figure out what is true or not. And, and the methods that are provided to us through science, through scholarship, 
And, and also to give out a shout out to the Reflections on the Life of the Spirit. The first unit is really helping people learn how to investigate truth, how to formulate questions and understand um, reality. But so there's an individual role of learning how to study, but also that, that capacity to consult with people and ap apply these methods. Well, I've, we've, we've come to the end of our time. I wanna thank our panelists, thank everyone in the audience. I understand that we have about 110 uh, viewers. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been a very rich conversation and it's barely scratched the surface of many deep and um, difficult questions. And I would like to recommend that uh, anybody in the audience, as well as the panelists, if you don't know R. David Lankes, L-A-N-K-E-S, who did something called the Atlas of New Librarianship, go look at that because you'll find out a, a lot more about these issues. So I think we've finished and I want to thank you all again and we'll bid you all good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you very much for joining us today.